Actually, I want to start with the end. And the end is that our entire life is dependent on plants. And, but I had not thought that maybe life on other planets would be dependent on plants and that astrophysicists looking for life would understand plant biology. But everything you do, everything you eat, almost everything you wear, the oxygen you breathe, the food you eat, the coffee you drank this morning, the cotton that's in your clothes, the fuel that's in your gas tanks, or in t the wood on the chairs up top, it's all plants. Without plants, our life doesn't exist. But we don't tend to consider them most of the time. We take them for granted as inanimate objects. So, but before I go into what a plant knows, I want to talk about genetics. Because I think probably a lot of you have some background in genetics, and that'll help us get into plant biology. So what we have here is a pedigree of a family that had four sons. Four males, I don't even talk about if it's humans or zebrafish or drosophila. And these four offspring, male offspring, have an affliction or a disease or some type of trait. It doesn't matter, I want to be politically correct. We'll call them red. <laughs> so these four males, what type of heredity is going on here? Is this dominant? Is this recessive? Any ideas? It could be dominant. You know, we can figure out what would be the chances of it. It's statistically possible. So let's go to the next generation and see what's going on. When we look at the next generation, we see that not everyone is red anymore. In this family, no one's red. Here, two out of three males are red. In this family, even with two wives, no one got red. <laughs> Here, we have one red and one green. So a new trait coming up. So are we X-linked, recessive, any ideas? We can go one more generation. We go one more generation, we see that in this generation, there's two females who are pink, we'll call them. They're becoming red. So I need to tell you what this trait is. This trait are physicians. <laughs> this is my father. These are my three uncles, my two cousins, my sister, and I'm the mutant. Okay? Because I didn't want to have anything to do with medicine or human biology. And because of that, I decided to do my PhD in plant genetics. And in my studies, I wanted to study something that was completely specific to plant biology, no connection whatsoever to human biology, and that's how plants respond to light. Now, some of you may remember experiments you did in fourth grade where you put a pea seedling in a closet and another pea seedling in the light, and the one that grew, well, this is Arabidopsis, our favorite model plant, but it's the same for most plants. When it's grown in the dark, it's tall and spindly, and when it grows in the light, it's short and has broad leaves. You remember these experiments that you did? And so I was interested in how do plants use light as a signal for development? Not light for photosynthesis, but light to change their structure. And we know that actually light signals coming through various photoreceptors, it's even enough five or 10 seconds of light to cause a plant to open and expand its leaves. And what I discovered was a group of proteins that regulate this process. And these were plant-specific proteins, which is what you would make sense. Until though, and this was at the end of my postdoctoral research, they started sequencing the human genome. And what I found was that all of these plant-specific proteins are encoded by genes that are also in each and every one of you. Which was a real kick in the pants. Because <laughs> I didn't want to have to do anything with human biology. But what I found in my lab is that those same genes that are necessary for a plant to know if they're in the light and the dark are involved in basic human processes, including cancer formation. Again, I didn't want to have anything to do with human biology in my research. But this led me to think that maybe plants and animals are more similar than we thought. They're definitely more similar than I naively thought. And how far can we take these similarities? Can we say that plants have senses? And as David gave in his introduction, and I won't even go through this, can we say that they have sight, smell, touch, hearing, balance, and memory? And what would be the evidence that supports such claims. So let's start with sight. This is the view from my office at Tel Aviv University. 
right now actually, there's no snow on the ground in Tel Aviv. This is the Mediterranean Sea. Um, it's not like in Boston. And if I was blind, this is what I would see. So I think we can all agree that there's a difference between being blind and sight. But if we would take someone who's blind and through some type of medical intervention, physical intervention, allow them to differentiate between gray and black and white, would that be considered a remedial form of sight? Would that be better than being blind? Yeah, I think so. You know. So sight is not only seeing in pictures. And if we would allow them to see, to differentiate between red and blue, then that person would definitely be better than just seeing black. So if you can agree that this is a form of remedial vision, then plants see at least as well as this. And how do we know that? Well, actually, you see it happening all the time on your plants at home on a windowsill. You've all seen plants start bending towards the light. Now what we have here is a time-lapse photography that was actually done by a child who posted it on, on YouTube, just changing the direction of the light every 12 hours. Okay, so this is time-lapse photography. We can actually see now plant movement. How do the plants know where the light is? Are they, can we say that they're seeing the light? What you might be surprised to learn is that one of the first people to study this was Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin, after he published his theories of evolution, um, devoted his life to plant biology. And one of his most important treaties was published in 1880 together with his son Francis Darwin, and it's called The Power of Movement in Plants. And we still use his book today for teaching introduction to plant biology. And what Darwin wanted to know or to understand is how plants respond to light. This is actually a drawing from Darwin's book. And he wrote in his own flowery language, because then scientists weren't taught to keep sentences short, that the plants were bent to the light that was so dim that I could not even read the hand of the grandfather clock across the end of the room. So a very dim light was enough to cause the plant to bend. But Darwin, being an excellent scientist, it wasn't enough for him to just record what was going on. He wanted to understand what the mechanism was. He wanted to know where is the eye of the plant? Where does it absorb the light? Now, his hypothesis was, and this is what you could see, you know, a plant um, bending towards the light. His hypothesis was that the light is sensed at the tip of the plant and that somehow it transduces the signal down the stalk to where there's the response. I don't know why that was his hypothesis. Maybe it was being anthropomorphic, thinking of it like the head. So to test his hypothesis, he carried out the, fo the following experiment. He cut off the tip of the plant. And when he cut off the tip of the plant, it lost the ability to bend to the light. So what's the conclusion? Well, that's right. Well, I got, new who said, I got news for you, though. If I cut off your head, you lose the ability to see a baseball coming at you also. So it could be that he was right, or it could be that we need some more controls. So he carried out a control where he covered the top of the plant with a, with a metal cap that was impervious to light. And then the plant still didn't bend, which supports his conclusion. But it also could be, though, that this cap was just too heavy and that it impeded the movement. So he did one more control, and this is the importance of controls and experiments, if there are any students, postdocs around here. He, did, he put a glass cap on the plant, and then the plant bent. So what we see here is an experiment that was published in 1880 with no expensive equipment, no high technology, but with the proper experimental structure. Darwin proved that the plant senses the light at its tip, and it transduces the signal down towards where there's the response. Not quite so different than if I hope I catch this. If I throw this in the air, I see the signal with my eyes, but the response is in my hand. Okay? So from this, we could say that plants see. Now, if you can accept the fact that plants see, you might still be surprised to know that they differentiate between colors. Because if you give plants 
red light on one side and blue light on the other, they'll only bend to the blue light. This was also done at the end of the 19th century by a scientist, a colleague of Darwin's named uh, uh, Professor Sachs from Germany. So here we see that just like us, plants can differentiate between colors. And in modern genetic experiments, we can now understand how this happens at a genetic basis. This is, for example, wild-type Arabidopsis plants, which, of course, bend to blue light. And just like there are people who are colorblind, and I imagine even some of the people here may be colorblind, we've isolated, my colleagues have isolated, colorblind Arabidopsis that when you give them blue light, don't bend because they don't see the blue light. These blind mutants, by the way, are mutated in a photoreceptor. They don't have the protein that's necessary to absorb the blue light. Thus, they're blind. Which leads to another question. How do irises know to flower in the spring? Or how do plants even differentiate between seasons? So, I mean, we know, for example, that if you put irises in a condition of a long day, like in the spring or the summer, I guess they don't, probably don't uh, flower in Massachusetts almost until summer. In Israel, they flower in February. Um, then they'll flower. Whereas if you put them in a short day condition, they won't flower. So summer, winter, flowering, no flowering. But if it was discovered in the early, in the middle 20th century, it's enough if you turn on the lights in the middle of the night, then that will induce the irises to flower. So that it's not that the plant is measuring the length of the day, it's measuring the length of the continuous night. But here comes the interesting part. What color of light does this? And if you turn on blue light in the middle of the night, it has absolutely no effect on the plant. But if you turn on red light, that will induce the plant to flower. Five seconds, it's enough. But now it even gets more fun. Because if immediately after you give it the red light, you give it a pulse of far red light. Far red light is the light we barely see as the sun is setting. It's around 730 nanometers. We're basically blind to it. The far red light cancels the effect of the red light and that inhibits the flowering. If you then, right after the far red light, you give it red light, it'll flower. It's actually, do you remember as kids, or there are some kids here who used to play with the light switches? You see how fast you could switch it before it would actually go on? It's the exact same thing. If you give it red light, it goes on. But if you switch it up and down, and the down being the far red light, it'll go off. And now what we're seeing here is that plants differentiate now between three colors, blue, red and far red, but not only do they differentiate, they remember. They remember what was the color of the last light that they saw. Ecologically, this actually makes sense. Because what's far red light for a plant? When, does it, when is it exposed to far red light? At sunset, at the end of the day. That signals to the plant, night has begun. And when does it see red light? At sunrise. That signifies that the night has ended and the day has begun. So when we give just even a flash of red light, day has begun. If we give it far red light, day has ended. So where is the eye for flowering? And interestingly, it's not in the tip of the plant. You could do the following experiment where you could connect two plants together. Actually, you could just do it with one plant and use a laser. And as long as you give the light to one leaf, the entire plant will flower. So that the photoreceptors, if I want to be anthropomorphic, the eyes, these aren't really eyes, I'm just using it for, to illustrate plants don't have eyes, um, is in the leaf of the plant for flowering. So if we compare human and plant vision, we have four photoreceptors in our retinas, which enable us to see a very small part of the visual spectrum. Plants have 13 photoreceptors. From a plant's point of view, we are visually challenged. <laughs> plants can see UV light that we're blind to. Um, plants have upwards of six blue light receptors, um, three green light receptors, another seven red or far red light receptors. 
Now, evolutionarily, there's no connection between these photoreceptors. In terms of structure, there is, but these genes evolved separately. Except for one photoreceptor, and that's a photoreceptor called cryptochrome, which is a blue light receptor both in plants and in humans. And I actually lied to you, and I hope some of you caught it. We don't only absorb light in our eyes. We also absorb light in our skin. And that's for our circadian rhythms, our daily clock. If you've ever been on jet lag and you know you should go outside to the light, it's because light resets our clocks. Light also resets plants' clocks. Plants can go through jet lag. If you take your house plant with you next time you go across the ocean, <laughs> it'll get screwed up. It will. Okay? And it's the same photoreceptor that regulates it in both plants and animals, which makes sense from an evolutionary perspective because even the most ancient organisms had to know what time of day it was. Okay, so again, so we see that plants, that we are visually challenged um, as in terms of plants. Why do we need, so, but plants don't see in pictures, and we do. We think that's actually more advanced to see in pictures, but we need to see in pictures because we need to see these details. Plants don't care about details. What they need to know is the direction, the intensity, and the duration of light. Um, okay. So now, if you could accept maybe that plants see, you might be a little more confused if I tell you that plants smell. So I want you to take a look at this following movie. And what we have, we're going to have here is a tomato plant in the same box with a parasitic plant, which is called daughter. In Latin, it's called cuscuta. This is a parasitic plant that can only survive if it attaches to a plant like a tomato and then sucks off nutrients. And you can see that somehow or another, this daughter, the cuscuta, found the neighboring tomato. How did it know where the tomato was? Did it see it? Did it smell it? Was it random? And I'm going to describe a series of experiments that was carried out by a plant biologist at Penn State University, where her hypothesis was that the cuscuta, this parasitic plant, smells the neighboring plant. And to test this hypothesis, again, without any huge technology, she carried out the following experiment. She constructed three boxes, a box in the middle where she planted the cuscuta that was connected by air tubes either to a tomato plant or to an empty pot containing soil as a control. And the cuscuta usually grew towards the air coming from the tomato plant. So, you know, that's what the so that's test that gives credence to her hypothesis that it was smelling it. So then she took the leaves of the tomato plant and made a tomato leaf perfume, which she put on a piece of cotton. We could call it you the tomato or whatever you want to call this. <laughs> and still the cuscuta grew towards the cotton that had the tomato. This is not tomato ketchup, this is tomato leaf extract. This is not Heinz, okay? So it still grew towards this area. Now the question comes, is it any plant or does it really like tomatoes? And I need to ask if anyone here has ever drank wheat uh, juice, wheat seedling juice. Anyone have high cholesterol? My wife thinks, has been told that if you drink wheat, uh, wheat grass juice, it can get rid of cholesterol. No one's tried that? It's very popular in Israel. You should give it a try. Well, don't give it a try. You'll see why. <laughs> If you've ever tasted it, it's really bad, okay? It really, you want to say moo when you drink it. Anyway, this next experiment is really important, as you'll see, because what she did is she gave the cuscuta a choice between an empty pot and wheat seedlings. And the cuscuta always grew away from it. Which, I showed this immediately to my wife, and then I, had, I went back to the statins, okay? So, okay? And of course, then, if you give the plant the choice between the tomato extract or the wheat, it will always go to the tomato extract. When we, what she could then do more advanced experiments, we now know that the wheat gives off a chemical that repels the cuscuta, whereas the tomato gives off chemicals that attract it. These are pheromones in the air. It's actually smelling. But actually, you all already know that plants have a sense of smell. For example, if you buy a very hard avocado and you want it to ripen, what do you do? Put it in a bag with a ripe banana. Okay? Because fruits 
give off a gas called ethylene, which induces ripening in other fruits. Which leads us to the question, what do trees talk about? <laughs> and the reason I'm going to ask this question is because of a finding that was first published in 1980 um, by a young researcher at Cornell University, what she found that if trees, uh, willow trees, are exposed to beetles, for example, well, I'm going to actually, this is a, a, a lot of experiments over 20 years now, we know that they, these trees will give off a gas called methyl jasminate, which is a volatile chemical. The methyl jasminate will be picked up by the neighboring tree, and it will induce the neighboring tree to secrete chemicals which are poisonous to the insects. And so then these neighboring trees will become resistant to the beetles. When this was first published, the popular press loved it. The New York Times even had an editorial which said, a tree's bark is better than its bite. That's good. But scientists thought that the results were overinterpreted. It was met with a lot of uh, resistance. But we now know, um, 30, 35 years later, that this is now a general paradigm. And the person who was a PhD student who did these experiments is now the director of the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology in Germany. But, but, but wait a second, though. Does this prove that trees are talking to each other? Or could it be that they're simply eavesdropping? Because not only are the neighboring trees resistant, the neighboring branches on the same tree are resistant. So it could be that these leaves that are attacked want to warn the other branches on the same tree, protect yourself, and that the neighboring tree is just benefiting from a communication that wasn't intended for it. Now this is very anthropomorphic. And until we have tree psychologists that we could ask them, well, what did you really mean? It doesn't matter. We have the facts that there is communication between the trees. So in terms of smell, plants aren't the best smellers. We can discern thousands of different smells. Plants can discern maybe 10 different smells. But for us, our smells are perceived in the nose. In plants, it's perceived in the leaves and the roots. Actually, there we would call it taste because it's not volatile, it's uh, soluble. Um, why do plants need to smell? For communication within the plant, maybe for communication between plants, but also for finding food, like with the daughter plant, it wanted to find its food. Why do we need to smell? Well, we need to smell for finding food also, okay? Or for identifying family, as any mother would know that they can identify their own baby by the sense of smell and also for the communication of physiological and emotional states, which is a nice way of saying the same thing that the plants are talking about, their physiological state. You know, we talk about the smell of fear. We communicate through senses of smell also. All right, let's move on to, the se to yeah, just look at this video for a second. It gets worse. Yeah, it gets you every time, doesn't it? How did that Venus flytrap know that that, it, did you notice it was a real, I don't even want to say the word, but you can come up with, you fill in the blank. That means it waited until it was in the middle. You know? How did it know that the bug or the frog was in the middle? How did it feel what was going on? I'll get back to that later. We also know, for example, that in animal biology, that shaking can stunt growth. I didn't want to show any pictures of that because that's awful to show. But also, in plant biology, what we have here is a tray of Arabidopsis, two trays, that are the exact same age, about seven weeks. The only difference is that this tray was touched three times a day with the hand going back and forth over it. Now, why should Arabidopsis care if a scientist is touching it three times a day. The truth of the matter is, it doesn't care. It doesn't know that a scientist is touching it. But what it probably thinks is that there's wind. Okay? Now, if you take a look at a tree, I'm sure that many of you are hikers, that's in a valley, a species of tree will be tall and majestic with a lot of branches, whereas the same species on the top of the mountain will be short, squat, with few branches. 
you probably think that this is a passive response to the wind shaking it. But it's actually an active response in order to help the tree survive. Just like that this tree is short and stunted, these Arabidopsis plants are short and stunted. Now, if you think about plant biology, perhaps the biggest difference between plants and animals is that plants are literally rooted into the ground. They are sessile organisms. They cannot escape their environment. If you're cold, you can go to Florida or put on a coat. If you're hungry, you can go to the, to the, to the supermarket and get food. If you're looking for a mate, I don't know where you go to anymore, but um, <laughs> there's things we can do for this. A plant, though, can't escape its environment. It has to adapt biologically. You know, what, actually, in, in other ways of saying it, what we do in a bad environment is escape. Escape is biologically very easy. Plants don't have that prerogative. And so when a plant is in the wind, it actively changes its development, makes itself grow radially rather than vertically. It inhibits its vertical in growth so that it'll survive. And that's often why, genetically, plants are much more complex than animals. Plants have more genes than animals. They have a gene for a good day and a gene for a bad day so that they can adapt from minus, no, sorry, from zero degrees up to 90 degrees. Same plant. If we would be outside naked from zero to 90, we wouldn't make it. Just think about that next time you look at your plants outside in the snow right now. You know, we see tactile responses all the time in plants without thinking of it, like this vine that's looking for something to hold on to. Let's get back to the, to the uh, Venus flytrap. How does it know when the bug is in the middle, because in the middle of the trap, you have these big hairs. When a bug touches, or a frog, or a human scientist, touches two of the hairs, it closes. If you touch just one hair, it won't close. But you have to touch two hairs within about 25 seconds. If you touch one hair, wait a minute, then touch another hair, it won't close. So we see here, not only is there a feeling of touch, there's a memory going on, a short-term memory. So you touch it once, within 20 seconds, touch a second time, it'll close. What's happening? Well, what happens when a fly lands on your skin? When a fly lands on your skin, it initiates an electric signal in your nerves, which is transferred to your brain, which transfers another electric signal to the muscles, and you try to hit the bug, and usually you miss. Right? What happens in an electric fly trap is that once two hairs are touched, it initiates an electric signal throughout the trap, which initiates it closing. There's no nerves, there's no muscles, but the basic cellular signal is exactly the same. And they'll change in electric potential. Actually, you can make a Venus fly trap close by putting two electrodes in it and changing the potential. Just like you can cause a muscle to twitch by putting two electrodes in it and having a potential. Alright, something's missing here. So, well, so what this is supposed to say, so that in terms of the sense of touch, it's the same in animals and plants. It's mediated by changes in electricity. Get to the question now, what do plants hear? What music do you think your house plants prefer? Classical. classical music. How many people think the plants prefer classical music? Anyone think that plants, what type of music do you prefer? Classical. classical. Okay, <laughs> that's important. Anyone think that plants prefer rock and roll? No. Okay, what type of music do you prefer? Uh, Say rock and roll. Yeah. Uh, okay, there you go. Okay, <laughs> we'll get to that. Um, the thing, I'll, I'll get to you, the answer is, plants don't care about music. <laughs> While there have been thousands and thousands of studies that show that plants have a, respond to the electromagnetic spectrum, that plants respond to volatile chemicals, that plants have a sense of touch, there's no credible data that shows that plants have a musical taste. And interestingly, everyone that's been published 
the plants grow better in the music that the person doing the experiment preferred. <laughs> I can show you, an ex well, we'll get to that in a second. So, but one of the reasons you might think that plants have a sense of music is because of a book called The Secret Life of Plants. Has anyone read that? Yeah, people my age and, and, and above. It was published in the 1970s. It's a wonderfully readable book, scientifically completely anemic. Um, <laughs> And it quotes another book called The Sound of Music in Plants, which was published a few years previous, which gives you this great vision of like a nun, you know, singing to her plants, right? Um, this was written by a woman named Dorothy Redelak, who was a music student in Colorado. Um, she went in the early 1960s, and she had a science requirement. This is all true. And for her science, this is Dorothy here, Mrs. Redelak. She went back to school after her children uh, went off to college. And for her, for her science requirement, she wanted to show that rock and roll was bad for the nation's youth. <laughs> now, some of you may remember the 1960s. Some of you may remember that your parents didn't really like rock and roll very much. Okay? So here's her experiment. This one, this plant was exposed to Led Zeppelin. This one was exposed to Jimi Hendrix. This one was exposed to Mozart. And this one was exposed to Ravi Shankar. Four plants, that's the entire experiment. And from this, she tried to publish it. There was very few controls. It was unpublishable, so she wrote a book. And I know I wrote a book also. It's not the same thing. Um, <laughs> but, you know, when people read this study, people got very scared, you know, about, you know, how, how is my, you know, I spent hours in my room in the late, in the 1970s with music very loud. Um, so plants don't have musical taste. No doubt about it. Um, but plants do have deaf genes, meaning that in, in 2000, when they published the plant genome, way before they published the human genome, they discovered that plants have hundreds of human disease genes. Like, for example, plants have the gene for BRCA, for breast cancer. Plants have the CFTR gene for cystic fibrosis. And plants also have the genes for deafness. So is that the reason that plants are deaf? No, we have to remember something. When we have the BRCA gene, we don't have, the BRCA gene does not exist to give us breast cancer. The BRCA gene exists to help cells divide normally. When there's a mutation in it, then we get cancer. So we call the gene under the name of the disease when the gene doesn't work. Deaf genes don't exist to cause deafness. They have other roles. Let's just see one role, because I think it's important to understand some of the molecular biology. For example, this is the hairs in, well, this is in a mouse, but in our inner ear, it looks quite similar. You know, these are the hairs that vibrate when sound signals go over it and allow us to hear. One of the deaf genes encodes a, encodes a gene called myosin. I won't get into the molecular biology of myosin. Myosin, except for to say that it's necessary for proper cell structure. And when myosin doesn't work normally, then you get an inner ear that looks like this. You don't have the proper hairs, and the plant is, and sorry, the mouse is deaf. So plants also have this same myosin gene. But plants don't have ears. So what's the necessity of this myosin gene? Well, plants actually do have e hairs, though. We call them root hairs. These are appendages that come out of the tips of roots. Sometimes, if there's any gardeners, you might see them when you pull out a plant, you see like these fuzz at the end. These are root hairs. So what happens when you have a mutation in the myosin gene? The roots are bald. They don't have any root hairs. It doesn't mean they're deaf because of this. It actually means that they have trouble absorbing water. But at, it's very interesting, I think, that at the biological level, the gene has the same structure. Here, it, of course, it affects hearing because it's in an organ that's necessary for hearing. Here it affects the ability of the plant to absorb water. But at the basic cellular level, the two genes have the, essentially the same function. So hearing. You know, why do we need to hear? Why do animals need to hear? Well, it enables rapid communication. It enables long-distance communication. We can scream at somebody. Or elephants can find each other over kilometers from their subsonic communication. And it enables a quick retreat. If someone would yell up and stand up and scream fire, 
we would all stampede out of here. Plants don't move. They can't run away. So perhaps, and this is just conjecture, in evolution, this sense wasn't necessary for plants to survive. Maybe that's why plants are deaf. Now, I, I, I want to qualify this in one, because I'm talking about negative results right now. But I want to ask you a question. What relevance is Ravi Shankar or meatloaf's a bat out of hell, and I'm saying that because I could show you a study where the corn plants grow better under meatloaf's a bat out of hell. <laughs> what relevance is music to plant evolution? You know, plants have been around for millions of years. Recorded music has been around for how long? So even these experiments, they're, they're ridiculous when you think about them. Why would we even be doing these experiments? So if a plant hears, maybe what we need to be doing is checking an ecologically relevant sound. And what might that be? For example, the ultrasonic sound of, wing, of insect wings, things that we are deaf to. Maybe that's where the plants are responding. And the truth is, there may be some evidence that there might be some responses there. But until we have those um, experiments that have been done and published by many labs, for right now, we can say plants don't respond to sound waves. Um, very quick. No, no, no we'll move to one, there, we have another sense that we, we forget about. It's called proprioception. We actually have six senses, and the sixth sense is not ESP. Proprioception allows me to touch my nose or to scratch behind my head. It's how we know where we are, how we keep our balance. Plants also keep their balance. You know, um, how does a plant know up from down, for example? You know, if you look at a plant, the roots always grow down and the shoots always grow up. How do they know where up and down is? Any idea? Well, you'd think light is one possibility, but the problem is, if you put a plant in total darkness, the shoots grow down, oh, no, sorry, the shoots grow up and the roots grow down. So the hypothesis was that it's gravity. And actually, this is an experiment that was done in the 18th century by an English nobleman. That's when you didn't have to have an education. All you had to do was be rich to be a scientist, sort of like now, actually, also. Um, <laughs> and what he did is he put his seedlings on a water wheel in his estate and let it spin for several weeks. And when he came back, all of the roots were going out with the centrifugal force, which is like a um, gravitational force and all the shoots were going inwards. So plants actually do differentiate between gravity. And we actually have mutants that have lost this ability to grow up, toward, to go against gravity. For example, hanging plants. Hanging plants have mutations in the gravity sensor. These plants would never survive in nature, but we love them as cultivated plants. Okay, so proprioception. Um, for us, it's everywhere in our body. And for plants, actually, it's at the tip of those shoots or at the tip of the roots, the no, tip of the roots, or in the stems. Um, I don't think we have time to go into this. Maybe during the Q&A we could talk a little about plants remember, but just you remember that we talked already about several types of memory. We talked about the 20 seconds for the, for the, um, for the Venus flytrap. We talked about the plant remembering the last light it saw. And it ends up that plants can also have long-term memories of months and even years transferring their memories to their offspring. Okay? So, have I convinced you, I hope, that plants have senses, that they have a sense of sight, that they can smell? We didn't talk about taste, but the only difference between taste and smell is that one is through volatiles and one is through um, uh, soluble signals, but mechanistically it's basically the same thing. Um, that plants have a sense of touch, that they can keep their balance, and that plants do have memories. Now, of course, I think what's amazing here is that with all of these senses, plants don't have a brain. They don't have a nervous system. So what does that mean for us? You know, we like to think that mammals, and within the mammals, the humans, are the epitome of evolution. That you need an advanced nervous system in order to see, smell, to respond. But here plants are doing all of these things 
in the complete absence of a nervous system, that their evolution has developed other mechanisms to do what we do all the time. And if there are those of you who are going to say, and I'm sure we're going to get to that, well, well, we're thinking about what we're doing. Think of the 4th of July, when your neighbor's barbecue either has tofu kebabs or shish kebabs, depending on your preference, and that smell comes over to you, and you start salivating. Have you decided that you're going to salivate, or did that happen unconsciously? Okay? So a lot of our sensory responses are completely unconscious. So this is what a plant knows. Um, it's, if anyone wants it in English, it's here. If you want it in one of 12 other languages, you can get it on Amazon. And I'm really happy to take any questions that you have. Thanks a lot.